What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, here for a reading of the Bitcoin Optech Group newsletter. Thank you very much to this entire organization for providing the most thorough information in this entire space. Thank you very much. And today, newsletter number 35 on February 26, 2019. This week's newsletter describes the availability of Libsec P256 K1 fork implementing BIP Schnorr SIC compatible signature, lists popular questions and answers for February from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange, and describes the usual notable merges in popular Bitcoin infrastructure project. Action items, none this week, just huddle. News. Schnorr is ready fork for Lipsec fifty Lipsec P two fifty six K one is now available. Blockstream cryptographer Andrew Polstra announced that the Lipsec P two fifty six K one CKP library used in the Elements project based sidechain such as Liquid now supports the BIP Schnorr compatible signatures in a variety of configurations, and that would be the basic single pub key and signature. These are almost identical in use. Those in use to those with Bitcoin's current ECDSA algorithm. Although signatures are serialized to use about eight fewer bytes and can be efficiently ver verified in batches. Music for multi-party signatures. On chain, these look identical to single pub keys and signatures, but the pub key and signature are generated by a set of private keys using a multi-step protocol, whereas multi-sig using the current Bitcoin script requires n pub keys and k signatures for k of n multi-sig security. Music can provide the same security using just one public key and one signature, thus reducing blockchain space, improving verification efficiency, and increasing privacy, and allowing much larger sets of signers that can support that supported by Bitcoin script current byte-sized and signature operations limit. But it does have two downsides. One, the increase in privacy also destroys provable accountability. There is no way to know which particular authorized signers were part of the subset that created a signature. And the multi-step protocol requires especially careful management of secret nonces to avoid accidentally revealing the private keys. Addressing the second issue, Poelstra's post details how Lipsec P256 K1 ZKP attempts to minimize the risk of nonce related failures and teases the possibility of even better solutions in the future. Two weeks. Adapter signatures for scriptless scripts. Using a multi step protocol, Alice can prove to Bob that her final signature for spending a certain payment will reveal to him a, a value that will satisfy some specific condition. For example, that value could be another signature that will allow Bob himself to claim a certain other payment, such as an atomic swap or a Lightning Network payment commitment. To anyone, to everyone besides Alice and Bob, the signature is just another valid signature with no special meaning. This can often improve the privacy and efficiency of the on-chain parts of the protocol by removing the need for including special data on-chain, such as the current use of hashes and hash locks in atomic swaps and Lightning Network payment commitments. The updated library does not make the features available on sidechains by itself, but it does provide the code upon both signature generation and verification can be performed, allowing developers to build the tools necessary to put Schnorr-based systems into production. It is hoped that the code will be received that the code will receive additional review and be ported into the upstream Lipsec P256 K1 library for eventual use in Bitcoin Core related to a soft fork proposal. 
To learn more, read the blog post or the developer documentation. Selected questions and answers from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. Stack Exchange is one of the first places for Optech contributors to look for answers to their questions or when we have a few spare moments of time to help curious or confused users. In this monthly feature, we highlight some of the top voted questions and answers made since our last update. First, why does BIP44 have internal and external addresses? External addresses are those you give to other people so that they can pay you. Internal addresses are those you include in your own transaction for receiving change. Peter Woolley explains that BIP32, upon which BIP44 is based, encourages using separate derivation paths for these keys in case you need to prove to an auditor how much money you have received, but not how much money you've spent or you've left. By giving the auditor the extended public key for just the external addresses, he can track your received payments, but still not receive any direct information about your spending or current balance via the change address. Now let's jump into the question here asked by Tim GFX. I've read other questions and their answers on this, but I still don't see the use for internal addresses. I get that you're supposed to send the change of a transaction there, but I don't see how this is beneficial. All it does is move your remaining funds on an address, right? And you could use just as easily move your funds to a new external address. I understand that the point is to use an address only once, but can, you, but can this also be done with external addresses? I hope that someone can explain what benefit internal addresses have. Thanks in advance. And we have here the question from Peter Woolley. The separation between internal and external addresses comes from BIP32. Using a different chain for each per permit for each permits you to give out an XPUB for just the external ones to an auditor. They would then be able to observe your incoming payments, but not your spending payments. Back jumping into the newsletter. Taproot and scriptless scripts both use Schnorr, but how are they different? In separate answers, Gregory Maxwell and Andrew Chow each describe the difference between the two proposed uses of Schnorr-based signatures. Also includes a description of adapter signatures, which can be used to enhance the efficiency and privacy of trustless contract proposals. And here the question proposed by Isoldur. How are scriptless scripts and taproot different? I recently read Aaron van Wittrum's layman's explanation of both scriptless script and taproot. I gather that both utilize the aggregation of Schnorr signatures to hide complex scripts, smart contracts, in a normal looking transaction. What are the finer details that set the two schemes apart? The first answer here is by the one and only G Max who, as far as I'm, yeah, he has invented both Taproot and Graftroot. One of the most common use of script in Bitcoin is to construct logically atomic operations, such as TX2 happens if and only TX1 happens. Scriptless script tells us how to use the additive properties of Schnorr signatures to construct atomic transactions without using script. Doing so this way will make them more efficient and private. Taproot is an idea which uses the additive property of elliptic curve cryptography public keys to allow users to commit to a script, which is only revealed if needed. If it is not needed, it is never even re revealed that the script existed at all. This is useful because almost all sensible contract terms, both smart and otherwise, can be rewritten as a top level or between everyone agrees. And the actual contract, and because with Schnorr, you can make a single signature work for the work for the everyone agrees case. Taproot itself does not depend on the specific properties of Schnorr, and it could be implemented, for example, for ECDSA. Technically, 
Taproot works outside of elliptic curve signatures itself to allow you to spend either via a single plane signature or some other conditions with the existence of other conditions hidden if you spend via the signature. But the ECDSA, but with ECDSA, it is not easy to use a single public key to represent the everyone agrees case. So Taproot would be much less useful. So, for example, if you had an output that could be spent either by Alice or by Bob, but only after a time limit, that pattern would be more efficient than ECDSA taproot than without taproot. Alice's key would be used to generate the root, and Bob's key and timeout would be in the hidden script. Great answer, thank you very much. And here the second answer by Bitcoin Core contributor Andrew Chow. Scriptless scripts are more like the construct used in hash time lock contracts and taproot is more like pay to script hash. The common example used for scriptless scripts is adapter signatures. With adapter signatures, what one person A wants is a valid signature which person B is able to provide but only if they receive a payment. This scriptless script allows person A to give person B money, and when person B takes the money, they automatically reveal to person A the complete signature that person A wanted. This process is done without any scripting, just by changing signature values, and the transaction all appears at, as normal transactions. However, what Taproot does is very different. Taproot hides a script inside of a signature. In Taproot, you have a tree of possible conditions. At the top level, you have a N of N multi-signature of all parties involved, or some script that allows some parties to spend. If all N parties agree, then the multi-sig is used and the transaction appears like a normal transaction. It even looks like a single transaction, right? Although it is a multi-sig. But if not all parties agree, then the script must be executed. Once this happens, the spending transaction will no longer look like a normal transaction. It will be very obviously spending a taproot output. The script will be revealed and the condition of the script will need to be checked. Thank you very much here for Andrew Chow for this very thorough answer. And last question here, jumping back into the newsletter. How much of block propagation time is used in verification? Gregory Maxwell explains that it's probably closer to 0% than 1% in the normal case, but that it can be much longer for the for worst case block that was specifically constructed to take a long time to verify. And jumping right here and into the Q&A, the question is from Danny. Block verification time. Does block verification time by all nodes in the network take up a large portion of the total block propagation time? What is the percentage on average? And here is the very thorough answer by G. Maxwell. It depends significantly if you're asking about the average, the nth percentile, time, or the worst case, including the possibility of maliciously constructed blocks. Nobody uses the first copy of a block they receive, obviously. A consequence of this is that the block propagation alone, along a slower path will be outpaced by block propagation on a faster path. As a result, overall propagation time depends mostly on the behavior of the fastest path, and there are many optimizations in the Bitcoin network to make the fastest path usually quite fast. On the vast majority of blocks that is larger than 99% of the transactions in the block are known in advance and already validated. With validation already cached, the only further validation required are trivial tests such as preventing double spends within a block and verifying that block time and height are consistent with the transaction time blocks. On blocks consisting of known transactions, relay among BIP 152 HB mode, peers occur without most of the validation. Only proof of work 
and the hash root are checked, which takes under one millisecond on a typical fast host. Similarly, fiber forwarding does not need to wait for validation or complete reception for that matter, even when many transactions are not known in advance. As a result, on average, the amount of time used for validation in propagation in the network today is probably closer to zero than to 1%. I would expect, based on the data from Matt's relay network, uh, that would be the fiber network, that the 99.9 .9 percentile would have a couple percent in validation. In the worst case, however, no transactions would be known or already validated. And also, in the worst case, a block could require minute minutes of processing to validate. Fiber would still forward fairly quickly, though, uh, still several times slower than typically due to the additional data needed. In such a worst case situation, the vast majority of the propagation time would be spent on validation even where fiber propagation is used, which does not need to wait for validation even when the data is unknown. Just do the final receiving node's own validation. The other answer may be of interest to you. The community has spent a fair amount of effort optimizing the non-malicious block case, both because it was clear that what needed to be done there and because provided Equ uh, equitable access to very fast propagation is essential to avoiding the creation, creating an advantage for large miners. Arguably, however, for many concerns, the worst case performance is more critical. Fiber makes some advance on the non-validation related worst case performance and not making the worst case worse was a major design goal in SegWit. But the worst case remains a more difficult and somewhat less well addressed problem. Very, very thorough answer. Thank you very much, GMAX. Jumping back into the newsletter with the notable code and documentation changes. Notable changes this week in Bitcoin Core, LD, C Lightning, Eclair, Lipsec P 256K1, and Bitcoin improvement proposals. This Bitcoin Core merge adds a productivity hint document describing tools and techniques developers have found to improve their efficiency. Although some are specific to Bitcoin Core and C++ development, others more generally apply to anyone who develops with Git or GitHub. The C Lightning merge provides the project's exciting, or sorry, existing documentation in a nicer format as readthedocs.io. Well, that is very exciting though. <laughs> These three C Lightning merges update various RPCs to now accept values suffi suffixed by with BTC, SAT, or MSAT to indicate the denomination of the value. The BTC value allows up to 11 decimal places and the SAT value up to three decimal places. But in both cases, the last three of these places must be zeros for on-chain operations where the extra precision isn't supported by the Bitcoin protocol. Other RPCs return new fields ending in MSAT that always contain in millisatoshi value. Several internal APIs changes are also made. This C Lightning change requires transactions, requires transactions have at least one confirmation before the wallet will attempt to spend their Bitcoins by default. This fixes a problem where the wallet would attempt to spend its own unconfirmed change outputs, but those payments would sometimes get stuck because the earlier payment weren't confirmed quickly. Several RPCs related to payments receive a min-conf parameter that defaults to 1, but can be set to 0. To continue the old behavior or set to a highly value uh, if desired. And this eclair change improves the heuristic used to help find a good route over which to send a payment. Peers, you have to subscribe to the Bitcoin Optech News Group because, well, these peers know what they're doing. Thank you very much to all the contributors and for this week, especially also all the answers and questions here on the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. Thank you very much for joining me and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.